We've been doing a series on what is our mission in the church. And uh, so we're going to give the kids some things. Parents, uh, you may need to help your kids. I'll cue you as to when the pages. You may need to help some of the younger kids with that stuff. Make sure, kids, you get a booklet and you get a sticker sheet, too. Good. That's Make sure you, everybody gets their own booklet and their own sticker sheet. And parents, for the younger ones, you may need to help them peel those off to uh, get them in the right place. And I'll be telling you, through, kids, I'll be telling you through the service when's the right time to put the sticker on your books there, too. Yeah, make sure you got a booklet, a sticker book to put it in, and the stickers that come with it. Now, ladies, before you go, any sixth graders in here? Any sixth graders want to come up, grab one too? We got plenty left. I just want to make sure we had enough left. So if you're a sixth grader and you'd like a sticker book and some of the stickers, come on up and grab one too. Good. Any adults that need a sticker book? Steve, you want a sticker book? Uh, Steve, come on up. Rhonda, you want? We got some left. I'm just saying. Yes. If, if it helps you know what's going on, come on up and grab a sticker. There you go. Grab a sticker book and a sheet. Need a sticker? Set a sticker. Wait, wait, come over and get your sticker book too. So you know what's going on. <laughs> Tracy, that's right, man. Some of you tactile learners need to be able to get some things to peel off and do that. So feel free. And I'm going to grab one just so I know when I'm doing this in the sermon too. Yeah, me too. Awesome. Last call, last call, last call. <laughs> okay. That's right. <laughs> oh, if your friends don't have courage to come up, come on. All right. While these guys are finishing up, give me that next slide. So if you remember, what we've been working on is our mission, right? Which is what? We missed something on that first part of that slide. What is, what's the first two words? Honor God and do what? Love people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's all say that together one more time. Honor God and love people into a growing relationship with Jesus. I think you guys have my second uh, part of my sermon up. Go to the next slide just to see what you got. I think you have the wrong one there. Yep. There should be a part one and a part two. I think you guys have the part one up. The part two up. I need the part one. So what we're going to do uh, on the first part of this is talk about, just review for ourselves about what does it mean to honor God, right? There we go, honor God, that's good. That helps me too because I was going to kind of like follow my slides and if they weren't here I was going to have to make it up while I was going on. So this will go a lot better if we have the right slides up, right? So let's talk some, just review because remember we, we spent the, the first part of honor God, right? And Pastor Greg gave us three points, and Pastor Holloway gave us one more as well about who God is. So let's start with that in terms of who God is. Give me that next slide. So the first thing is, we all need to remember that God is what? He is what? Supreme. That's right, yeah. I love the book of Job, and a lot of you don't get to the tail end of it, which is the best part of the book of Job, because you get caught up in the first part. Remember, Job was a guy who everything seemed to be doing great, and he was honoring God, and Satan said, hey, let me sift him a little bit and give him a hard time. And remember, he took away all his riches and all his family, and he took away his health, and Job was left there, and, uh, but God left him free, three friends that came and were giving him a hard time about, Job, confess your sins. Obviously, you did something wrong that God did all this stuff to you. And at the end, uh, God said, no, this was for my glory. But, but God at the end, he says, no, you forgot something in this process. You forgot that I am God. And, and he, told Job, he said, Job, you're not my judge, Job, of my character. Oh, am I not on? Oh, okay. Is this, be is this better? Woo! You better be careful. You're giving me power here. <laughs> All right. I'll do that. Um, so, so he told Job, he said, uh, don't forget about who I am. And this is one of those quotes. He says, where were you, Job, when I laid the foundation of the earth? 
Who determined its dimensions and stretched out the surveying line? What supports its foundation? And who laid its cornerstone as the morning stars, get that, the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy at the birth of creation? Kids, sticker number one, God with creation, right? You know what? God says, I am the creator and you are not. And I was here from the beginning and you weren't. And don't forget that. Don't forget who is God and who is not. So that's one, one part of God's character and who he is. He's supreme. Let's look at another one. Go ahead in the next one. And remember we talked about that God is triune, right? There's a Father and a Son and a Holy Spirit. I want to read you this one, this one verse from when Jesus was getting baptized by John. It says, after his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove settling on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my dearly love son who brings me great joy, right? And here in this instant of time, we see the three parts of God. We see the son being obedient to the father in baptism. We see the Holy Spirit descending down on him. And we hear from the father who's commenting on the fact that I love my son. And as a matter of fact, and there's another time when he was talking to the disciples, he says, this is my dearly beloved son. Listen to him, okay? Listen what he has to say. So, so we know that, that God has three distinct personalities, and they have their own roles, but they are together as a unity of God. And then Greg also said, not only God, three personalities, but what? Go ahead and see the next slide there. He said that God is one, right? There is one true God. There aren't three different gods that reign together. There isn't one God that just happened to reveal himself as a son one day and a father another day and a spirit. No, there's this mystery of a God who has three personalities and they're distinct personhoods, and yet they're one. And we get that from the, remember we read from the verse in Deuteronomy, it said, the Lord our God, the Lord is, is one, right? Yeah. And let's go ahead and look at this next part of God's character. And this is when uh, Pastor Van talked about us, the fact, in, remember he was talking about the fact that jealousy to us seems to be a, a terrible quality, you know? A jealous person isn't a good person. And yet, you know what? God says he is jealous for our praise because he's jealous for us to be part of his family and not be away from him, right? And we got this verse from Deuteronomy as well. He says, for the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God, right? Because honor is due to him, because he is the creator. He is the one that has, has intervened in our lives and done all these things. And when we give praise to ourselves or to somebody else, God says, what you are doing is you're mocking me at that point. And, and you're, not, you're not being honest about who really deserves worship here. And, and God is jealous from that perspective. And it's a good thing because, you know what, the, the, difference, uh, the different part, of, if it wasn't a jealous God, he'd be a what? He'd be an indifferent God. And an indifferent God would be one, well, hey, if you make it, great. If you don't, okay. Because it, it's no big deal to me. Hope you do well, right? No, God is not indifferent. He's a jealous God, and he pursues us, right? And that's a good thing because we're running hard away from him, and we need to be pursued, yeah. So, let's look at that. So, so, first off, we talked about who God is, right? And the second we said is, okay, so what, is it, what does it look like? Give me that next slide. What does it look like for us to honor this God that is supreme, that is triune, that is one, and that is jealous? What does it look like to honor Him? Well, I would say the first step in honoring God is, go ahead and give me that next slide there, is first, you got to make a decision, have you accepted his son? And what do I mean by that? Well, God says, first off, that all of us have sinned, and that's the state that all of us started in. And it doesn't matter whether you're a pastor like me or a pastor Greg, or if you're young like Judah here in the front row, all of us, all of us have sinned. What is sin? Sin means God says we need to be going this direction, and you know what? I head out the opposite way, because that's where I want to go. I don't care about where God wants me to go. I'm going to do my own thing, right? Well, we've all headed off and done stuff that we know 
is opposed to what God wants us to be doing. That's what sin is. We, we have a name for that. If you go down to the courthouse, we got the Ten Commandments up there on a, on a, on a, on a set of stone. It may be gone at some point, but that was never there to save us. That was help, there to help, rem- help remind us of how poorly we've done following God, right? So it says, don't lie. Well, guess what? I lie. It says, honor your parents. Kids, have you ever dishonored your parents? Have you ever done something you knew that they wanted you to do and you chose to go do something else? Well, God, that's sin, right? He says, don't have any, don't put anything else ahead of me. Well, I've done that a lot of times and so have you. We could go down every one of those Ten Commandments. We, we've all broken them all. And so God says, we're all sinners. And God says, okay, well, you all work really hard at that, so I'm going to pay you for that because every workman deserves his wages, right? Well, guess what God says? The next thing he says in Romans 3.23, he says, the wages of sin is what? what? Say it again. Is death. Okay. So we all worked hard, and we're going to get our wages. And God says, yeah, you, you, your sins have put an, an enmity between me and you. It's put a great distance between me and you. As a matter of fact, because of this, you're under my wrath, and you will not only die physically, but you're going to die spiritually for all of eternity as well because of this. And God is a just God, and we got justice. Everybody here would get that, and we would, we, nobody could complain because we'd earned it, right? But you know what? God isn't just a God of justice. He says, I'm a God of mercy as well. And what's mercy? Mercy is when you get what you don't deserve, right? Justice is when you get what you deserve, yeah. And so God says, but God showed his great love for us by sending, sending who? Christ. Who is Christ? Christ was part of the Godhead. And so here God, remember the one who is supreme, who created everything, came into his own creation and lived just like you and me in a body from a baby on up to a grown man. And then he took all that wrath that God had that I should have taken. Jesus said, I'm going to take it because I'm I'm going to stand in your place, right? Right? When God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still what? Sinners, yeah. Still under justice. Because none of us had earned any of God's favor. And we couldn't because we'd earned his wrath because of all the the things we'd done that were opposed to him, right? And and you know what God says? I'm going to make this very simple for you. This is where you have to choose. Do I want to humble myself before God? and accept this gift of his son or not. That's the first step to honoring God in all of our lives. I, nothing else matters. I don't care about how much you want to read your Bible or pray or come to loop classes or how many services you've been or how, how good a person you are. That's all irrelevant. God says the first step to honoring me is to accept that gift of my son. Listen to what he says. He says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be what? saved. Yeah, saved from being far away from him and not being part of his family and being brought into his family. Yeah. But you know what? God says, that's how, that's your first step to honoring me. But he also says, if you decide not to do that, you dishonor me. Because God says, I love my son. And remember after Jesus has died, what we read in Philippians 2, he says, he raised him what? What? into heaven, seated him at the right hand, put all things under his authority. That's what God the Father did with Jesus. And he says, I have honored my son above all else in all of creation. And if you decide, and I decide, God, I don't need your stinking son. I'm, I think I'm going to make it on my own, right? Well, you can do that. But guess what God says? And this is, what he, this is his other promise to you here. He says, anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. Yeah. So, kids, that's your second sticker, remember? Accepting Jesus, right? That's our first step to honoring God. Now, the reason I'm bringing that up is you, you, can, you can fool me, you can fool your kids, you can fool your family, kids, you can fool your parents, but we, the one person you cannot fool is God. And God knows whether you've really made this choice or not. And so, 
for those of you that can look back and say, yeah, I, I know I was a fool, and I knew I was running hard away from God. And there's a point in my li- life where I had to humble myself before God and say, I agree with you that this is who I am, and I agree with you that I'm not God, and I'm going to face your wrath. But I also, God, I desperately want your mercy, and I accept that gift, right? So if you know that, great. That was your first step to honoring God. But you know what? And I don't care whether you're 80 years old sitting here, or I don't care if you're six years old sitting here. If, if you know in your heart you said, no, I haven't done that. I haven't chosen Christ. I haven't told God that I need his son, that I can't do it on my own, right? Then you're not honoring God. Just, that's just where you are. And, and I don't care. You don't have to worry about reading the Bible more, and you don't have to read about coming to church more and doing all the rest of these things and being a good person and a nice person because you're not honoring God because he honored Jesus, right? And he's calling us to honor Jesus as well too. So I would challenge you, think hard about that today. And we're going to give you an opportunity to make a decision about that a little bit later on too. Well, for those, of, for those of you that have chosen to honor the Son and to say, I accept the fact that you paid this, you came into my world, and you stepped in here and you did this for me, right? There's another step after that, too. Let's, keep, let's look at that next slide. You know what? God says it isn't just enough to honor my son and you just go live your life the way you, you want to because God says, guess what? Now you're part of my family. And God says, when I brought you into my family, the things they did, remember, he says, he adopted you as children. He says, I declared you to be holy, not because you are, but because of what my son did for you. And I give you my, my spirit to live inside of you. Part of God is now living inside of us, right? There to be our counselor. And he says, I give you good gifts so you could be part of the good works I have going on. But God says, you know what? All of us, I got the same body I used to have, right? I got the same memories I used to have. I got the same... Yesterday, I was out being a fool, and I sort of have, I know, I know about being a fool. I know about doing stupid things, because I've done it my whole life. It's really easy for me, and it's comfortable, and it's there. And so God says, you need to put those things off, because that's not who you are anymore. He says, I want you to put on Christ. I want you to be like my son, because I, now you have the power to do that through me. Look, what does he say here in Ephesians? He says, go back to that last slide, guys. He says, throw off your old sinful nature not because you could do that on your own, but because now you're, my, now you're my family, right? You don't have to wear that anymore. He says, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. He says, instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new... Did you get that? What's the Spirit? He's, he's talking about God's Spirit, right? That He gave us, right? Is there to tell us about what the new thoughts and attitudes are. Put on your new nature, created to be what? Like God, truly righteous and holy. And God says, yeah, the first step to honoring me is accepting my son. But the next step is, he says, start acting like the person you are now because you're part of my family. Stop acting like who you used to be, which was a fool who lived outside my family, right? Well, what does that look like? Give me that next slide. Well, here's some of the things, and we get this from another book in the Bible, from Colossians that says, well, what are those things are that I need to be putting off and what are the things I need to be putting on? He says, hey, you need to put off sexual immorality. Well, what is that? That's, that's, that's using other people for my pleasure, right? Not, do, not wanting the best for somebody else. Impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, right? Kids, that's when you want your brother or sister's stuff, even though it's theirs. It can be mine. And if I, if I fight them hard enough or I scream at my parents long enough, maybe they'll give it to me. Well, God calls that greed. Rage, right? That's when we get out of control and we just go, I'm going to be angry at you until you do what I want you to do for me. Malicious behavior, slander, that's when you, I say bad things about you so that people like me, right? And I don't care whether it crushes you or not because that's irrelevant, right? I want me to feel good. I want you to like me, so I'll crush you so I can be liked. Dirty language and lying and not telling the truth. God says, you don't have to be like that anymore. Put those things aside, right? But he says instead, he said, these are the things I want you to be. 
And, he's, and the amazing thing God says is, you don't know, if you haven't honored my son, you can't be these things. You can be a lot of things, but you can't be this. He says, be tenderhearted. Have mercy. Why? Because, wow, you have a father who is merciful to you, and so now you can be merciful to other people. What does that mean? Remember, mercy was, I got what I didn't deserve, right? I'm really good about giving other people justice. <laughs> you earn this, you get it, right? And yet God says, well, I'm a merciful God. I gave you mercy. I want you to be merciful with other people as well. What else does he say? Humbleness, right? Being willing to put somebody else's needs ahead of my own. Being gentle, being patient. Make allowances for others' faults. Yeah, we all have a list of everybody else's problems. And somewhere at the bottom of that list is where we decided, I get to write you off because you got enough problems, so I don't have to deal with you anymore. Well, guess what? God says, no, no, I'm, I'm going to step past those things because here's a God who loved this other person, right? We're going to talk about that more on loving others. And so I'm going to step past that, like God stepped past all those things that I've done and forgave all those things as well and, and having forgiveness for others. That's what God wants us to be putting on. And I can't do it on my own because it's not in me. And yet, as I've been adopted in this new family, I can look at my father and my brother Jesus now, right, and the other people in my body and say, hey, that's who I've been called to be, right? That's who God wants me to be now. So that God says, as you do these things, you honor me because now you say, I want to be part, as I go out, I want to be represented. I want to be like my father, right? Because my father's amazing, and I want to be like him. And as you start reflecting him in your life, guess what you're doing? You're honoring your Father every day as you live that way, right? Now, the flip side is, as I choose to be, do things like I used to be, I'm doing what? I am dishonoring my Father, right? So, just, just admit it, right? And a lot of times, we dishonor him with things that nobody else can see. So, it's okay, because only I know about it, and you didn't know about it, so it's not dishonoring God. Well, guess who does know about it? God knows about it, right? God knows about it. Give me that next slide. So, this morning, and we do this the first Sunday of each month, and Pastor Greg's going to come up and, and lead us in communion, but we got an opportunity to remind ourselves of what Christ did for us, right? And by doing that, we're also reminding ourselves, I didn't do it for myself, and you know what? I, I need this reminder at least once a month because a lot of times I'm thinking I'm doing pretty good. And I, if I start doing that, I start looking around at everybody else and say, I think you're not doing that well, but I think I am, right? And I need that reminder. No, I, I, did, I wasn't doing very well. <laughs> I was doing terrible. And it was only because God gave his son for me that I can claim anything, right? But before, before we come and have a chance, and that's part of our honoring God, is remind, remembering those things, right? But before we have a chance to do that, there's something else we're going to do first. Greg, come on up here with me. And I want, to, I want to read you another verse here too. Go ahead and give me that next slide. This is from the book of Ephesians. And he says, listen to this. He says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed in the day of redemption. Well, what, what's this all about? What's, you know, how do I grieve the Holy Spirit? Well, listen to what he says. He says, Get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger and brawling and slander along with every form of malice. Oh, that sort of sounds like those things I was supposed to be putting off, right? That list of things. And when I choose to lie and I, when I choose to rage at other people and want their stuff instead of my own stuff, guess what I'm doing? I'm, I'm grieving God's spirit, right? And I'm, I'm putting some barrier between that relationship between us. And yet, here's, here's an amazing thing. God says, that, that, that distance, even though you're still my son or my daughter, we got some tension between us. And, but God says, I give you, you don't have to go work for five years or read so many Bible verses or, you know, do this or that. God says, no, nope, you can take care of it this, this morning. Now let's read this next verse up here. He says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to do what? forgive us our sins and to cleanse us 
from all unrighteousness and put us back in a position where, hey, I'm, I'm honoring you again, God, right? So Pastor Greg's going to lead us in a little bit of time, a reflection on that. And I would challenge you, if you know there's some things you need to get cleaned up, take care of it this morning. Or do. Here we go. Hey, kids, uh, we've done communion. So feel free to go ahead and put your sticker on there for, uh, for communion because we've already participated in that. All right. Let me see if I get my, my AV guys to get the second part of our mission coming up. Remember we talked about honoring God. But that's not where it ended. And just remind yourselves, go ahead and give me the next slide there. The next part of our mission is to love people into a growing relationship with Jesus. Yeah, so a lot of times we're pretty good about that first part. We work pretty hard about that, saying, okay, God, it's you and me, and I'm going to work on honoring you and, and doing the things you want me to do. But sometimes we forget that next part about loving the people around us. Go ahead and give me that next slide. You remember what Jesus said? He said, you know, uh, I want you to be like me, right? And so part of being like him is to realize, well, why did he come? What's his heart? What's he interested in? Well, this is what he said. He says, for the Son of Man came to find and to restore the lost. And Jesus said, that's, that was my passion. That's what I was all about. That's the, that's the only reason I even showed up on this, on this earth to come back and to find that was lost and restore them back into friendship with me. Yeah. So what I want us to do is just reflect on, now, go ahead and give me the next slide. When, uh, when Pastor Steve was up here with us, he said, hey, there's, well, how do I do that? How do I love people? He gave us five ways of doing that, remember? He talked about, first off, is valuing other people the way that God values them, sees them, not the way I see them. We all, hey, first time you meet anybody, you judge them, right? You look at the way they're dressed, color of their skin, what kind of clothes they're wearing, how they speak, and then you put them in some little niche and say, well, this is who you are. Well, guess what? God says, hey, pull them out of that niche and put them into my niche. Because my niche was this was somebody who's so valuable to me. I, the ruler of the universe, decided I was going to die for them, right? He says, that's the only niche you need to put them in. The next one, he says, speak truth and love to them, right? And sometimes we just want to love somebody, let them keep on being a fool. That's not loving them. There's no truth there, right? And sometimes we say, I want to give you the truth, but I'm going to give it so hard it's going to break you. And that's not loving you either, right? So God says, speak the truth to love in them. The next one, he says, Get active. Go out and find out where their needs are and come alongside the things that they're hurting on. Because a lot of times when people are struggling and hurting, they can't see past that. God says, I'm going to give you the opportunity to relieve them of that so they can hear about me. And then he said, forgive them. Because you remember, God says, I forgave you out of grace of everything. And a lot of times we'll put a barrier up. And I, you know what the hardest people to forgive is a lot of times? The people in your own family. Because you know what? Family knows how to hurt people better than anybody else and God says yeah guess what you're my family and I forgive you and I want you to forgive other people in your family as well and the last point was he says point them to Jesus because you know what remember that first step of honoring God is what is honoring the son and if you never tell them about the son if you never tell them they're far about the far away right then you're not loving them so God says point them to Jesus right so I just want us to go through some of the people that Jesus interacted with. I want you to think about those five things. I want you to think about how he loved them. Go ahead and give me that next slide. So remember Jesus was with his disciples and he, he went through a part of the country with the Samaritans. And these people, his people, the Jewish people, hated the Samaritans. And this was a race that they hated. And guess what Jesus did? What did he do? He stopped and he talked with them. And he spent some time with them. Let's see what happened there. He said, many Samaritans, after he stopped and talked to that woman at the well, believed in Jesus because of what the woman had said. And when they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe, right? Now think about those things on the top. He valued them even though the people in his country didn't value them, right? He spoke truth to them, right? He and he pointed them to Christ. And he served them because he took time with them, right? Let's look at another group of people. Go ahead. Remember there was the, the woman who was caught in adultery? And what were all the, all the folks in her village getting ready to do? They are getting ready to kill her. Because they are going to give her justice, right? No mercy, but just justice. 
And remember what Jesus did? He got down on the ground and he started writing out some things on, we don't know exactly what he wrote in the dust. There probably was some things that those guys have been doing that they desperately needed mercy for and that they needed to be glad that God wasn't giving them justice, that God was giving them mercy. And they all walked away. And what happened then? Then Jesus stood up again. He said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus, get this. He says, neither do I. Now, this is the God of the universe, and he had every right to condemn her because she'd walked away from his truth, right? He says, I don't condemn you. But, but guess what he says? He says, go and sin no more because I've given you my mercy, and now you can walk away from a life that's been hurting you and everyone else around you. Don't do that anymore, right? Jesus valued her, and he spoke truth to her, and he forgave her. But he pointed her to where she needed to be going, right? Let's look at somebody else. One day, some parents brought their little children to Jesus so he could touch them and bless them. But the disciples saw this, and kids ain't all that valuable, right? Jesus, don't mess your time with the kids because we got some more people that you really need to be speaking to, right? Guess what Jesus said? And, they, and when the disciples saw this, they scolded the parents for bothering who? Jesus, right? And Jesus called for the children, and he said to the disciples, let the children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. Yeah. So Jesus went to those that the rest of us didn't value very much, right? And what did he do? He valued them, right? And he spoke truth to those kids, right? And he pointed them in the way that they needed to go. Kids, you can put that sticker in your book where it says love like Jesus, right? Put that in there. Let's look one more. Let's keep going. You guys remember Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was part of the power group. He was the one that was oppressing everybody because he could tell you, you got to come pay your taxes and I get to take some more and you can't stop me. So he was stealing from everybody in his city and everybody was powerless to keep him from stealing from them. Can you imagine that? Have somebody walking down your street and coming in your house and kids just grabbing whatever toys they wanted of yours and getting your, your phone and your TV and taking your folks' car or whatever else, and nobody could do anything about it because everybody was afraid of him, right? Well, guess what? When Jesus went and spent time with them, how do you think everybody felt? This is the guy who's ripping us all off, and you're going to spend time with him? Guess what? When the people were displeased, he's gone to be a guest of the notorious sinner, they grumbled. And meanwhile, Zacchaeus, because Jesus did what? He valued him. And he took time to go be with him and speak with him. And guess what happened to Zacchaeus' heart? Well, Zacchaeus experienced the mercy of his Savior. And then guess what that did to him? He said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. If I have cheated people of their taxes, I will give back four times as much. And, and what did Jesus say? Salvation has come to this house today. This person you despise because he was your oppressor, and God says, I don't see him as an oppressor. I see him as someone who desperately needs salvation, right? That's how Jesus saw people and loved them. Give me that next slide. Well, what about the leper, right? The one that's unclean, right? The one that we're all going to stay away from because he could end our lives if we're around him. Large crowds followed Jesus as he came down the mountainside, and suddenly a man with leprosy, usually these guys wore bells, and they had to ring them so everybody knew when they were coming, so you would stay away from them. They were, they were not allowed to come close to anybody. And this guy came up, approached Jesus, and knelt before him, and that was a death sentence for this guy, because he could be put to death for coming close to a group of folks. Lord, the man said, if you are willing, you can heal me. And make me clean. And Jesus reached out, touched him. Who knows when the last time this guy had been touched by anybody. Right? Because it was death to touch him. And yet the Savior reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said. Be healed. And instantly the leprosy disappeared. Right? He served him with where he needed to be served. Because he got past that terrible disease so he could see the Son of God, right? Give me that next slide. You know what, you know what God said? 
He said, you are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. Now, we, we all have salt in our homes. And you're probably going, I don't know, Will. I mean, I've had my Morton salt there for 20 years in my cabinet. and Seems like it's working pretty good to me. Well, let me tell you, in Jesus' time, they didn't have this refined salt like we do, right? They probably dried it from the, uh, from the salt water from the seas. And in that salt was calcium and little bits and pieces of shells and that kind of stuff. And you know what? If the salt stayed in the bag for a long time back then, it was, the, it was so humid that eventually the humidity in the air would let the salt melt out of that bag. And you know what you'd be left with? You'd be left with a bag of white crystal powder that sort of looked like salt, but it had nothing in it. And it was worthless, right? It didn't taste like salt. It didn't preserve like salt. It didn't do anything. But it looked like salt, okay? It looked like you had a bag of some really good stuff, right? And the point was, at that day, you used your salt because if you let it sit around, nothing, it, it went worthless, right? Think about that. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Go ahead and give me that next slide. So, two things need to happen. That salt needs to get poured out, and that light needs to get turned on. Could I have the ushers, if you guys would close those back doors for me? Don't worry, nothing bad's happening. And I'm going to wander over here. I'm going to turn a few lights off for us. And James, I don't know, how do I turn off these spotlights in the back? Can you do that for me, buddy? While he's running up here. And I need two, I need uh, my two helpers. Got one right here. Come on up. It's, is Kaylee, is she in here right now? I don't think so. Sister, you want to come help? Come on up here. So we're going to do a couple of things here. So what I want you two to come on up here is do something for me. And I want you to take a salt container for me, okay? And I want you to take a salt container for me too. Guys, I want you to bring that house light up for just a minute. Bring that house light back up, guys. Thank you. Now, I want you to stand at this table, and I want you to imagine, you know what these little things of salt are? This is us sitting here at church today because we're all together, and we all got real salty because we heard a bunch of truth, right? But we're all inside this little building, and how are we doing seasoning Xenia or Green County? Well, not too good because if somebody drives by the church, we're all locked inside this building, right? And guess what God says? God says, I don't want you to stay all contained in here. I want you to do something else. I want you to go spread yourself out. So I want you to go pour this on the table. Go ahead. Go ahead. Lift it up way high. Make a big pile. There you go. See? This, this is what God wants you doing. Lift it right up there. Let it, let it flow out. Hey, you notice I'm not cleaning the church today. So this is what, where's Jamaica? Is Jamaica and Monty here? I'm so sorry. I, I, maybe I'll help you after, afterwards. But guess what? God wants us to do what? Get all spread out this week. Right? Don't stay inside this because you know what? If we all stayed in this church and just took care of each other, we'd go bad. Right? We'd lose our saltiness. So God says, get out and do that. Right? Is it about out? How's that church doing? Is it about emptied out this week? Keep it going. Thank you. All right. Drop those back. Let's give these guys a hand here. Thank you. Helpers. Grab a seat, grab a seat. Now, next thing is, God says, so I want you to get out. Get sprinkled around. Next thing he says is, I want you to be a light out there. Now, you look around, there's a lot of lights in this room, right? We turned some of them off. I got this light up. You, you may have said, well, there's a lamp up there, but it's not that big a deal. Well, what if this was you? And you may go, well, 
you know what, Will, you can turn my light off because it's still pretty bright, right? It doesn't really matter. But when you leave this building and you're not around all the rest of these lights, guys, go ahead and drop, those, drop the rest of those lights down. You may go back to a family where you're the only one that knows Christ. You may go back to a neighborhood where you're the only one that knows Christ. You may go back to school where you're the only one that knows Christ in your classroom. You may go to work where you're the only one, right? And you are the bright light because the world's pretty dark out there, right? But you know what God says? He says, you know what? You can either be really bright in a dark place this week or you can be just like everybody else and hide it and just let it be real dark, right? Scott says, no, no, no. I want you, when you walk out of this building, don't put yourself down. Don't think you're not a very bright thing because you are, right? Because you may be the only bright thing in a very dark place. God says, you got a chance to go out and love like Christ loved, right? Yeah. Bring those house lights back up for me. Well, let me just give you a few thoughts of some things that maybe you could dive into to be salty this week or this month, or maybe to step out and be a light someplace. Did you know that every Friday night, there's a group of folks from Emanuel to go and visit the kids at the detention center, the Green County Detention Center? And these are kids as young as elementary age kids. They're in jail. And some of these kids don't get any visitors all week except for some of you who go and visit them. And we all get this prayer letter every week to pray for those kids. So maybe, maybe you could go with Van and Mike and go visit those, play, those kids in a really dark place in their lives. Or maybe you could pray for them this week, right? And lift them up. Do you know, do you know that the first Saturday morning at 9 a.m., we get together with other believers here and, and we pray for the lost in our city? What would that look like for you to come alongside of the brothers and sisters of Christ and pray for the lost in our city on that first Saturday in the morning? Did you know that on the third Saturday morning, we actually go out <laughs> in groups of four and we go out and pray for people in our city? And last, this last month, we had a group that went to McDonald's and met all kinds of folks at McDonald's that desperately needed light. We, met, we had people that went to some of the retirement homes in our city and pray with some folks that nobody else visited to there. We had folks that, that just were out in the park and people were wandering around in the park into the coffee shop and did that kind of stuff and found people to pray for. You could do that. Do you know that on the fourth Thursday evening, we have over 100 people in our city come here that are desperate for food, and you can bless them by helping serve that food, but you can also bless them by helping them carry their food out to their car by waiting with them in line and talking with them and praying for them. Because it's a lonely thing waiting for an hour and a half just to get in line for food. And you could come alongside them during that time. Do you know that the first Saturday and the second and third Sunday afternoons, we go to some of the nursing homes in our city and we have some church services and just go visit people? And many of those folks have nobody else that gets to visit them at all other than those of us that come and visit them. You could go bless them. You know, you could, you, you, could, you could look around here in the congregation and say, hey, here's somebody that's not part of a small group. I got, I'm meeting in a small group. What if I invited them to come? Oh, I'm going to a women's Bible study on Tuesday night or Wednesday morning, or I'm going to the guys' Bible study on Wednesday night. What would it look like if you invited somebody else to come with you to that, right? What if you decided that right after church, the most important thing wasn't getting out of my car and leaving here as fast as I could, but you said, I'm going to commit to stick around for 15 or 20 minutes and find somebody I've never met before and talk with them and actually say, how can I pray for... Isn't that an amazing thing? Pray for somebody at church? Stick around and pray for somebody here, right? Instead of trying to say, my life is so complicated, I've got to leave. And being irritated because Will or Greg or Van went over by five minutes, right? And you messed up my whole Sunday. Well, what if your Sunday was about sticking around and praying for somebody, right? What if you decided... You're going to be a buddy for a special need kid on Sunday morning so their mom and dad could be taught. And that kid could have some love during that time. 
What if you decided that you're going to come and be part of some of our children's classes and serve in the nursery and the twos and threes and fours and fives or teach a class, right? Or come and be with Van with the youth group on Sunday evening and walk alongside some kids. What if you decided you're going to come on Wednesday night, be part of Blast, right? Our, our Wednesday night uh, elementary program and just come and play with those kids and teach with them and love on them, right? What if you just said, hey, I'm going to find somebody at this church is isn't far as far along as I am. I'm just going to ask you, what would it look like if we just got together when we met on a regular basis so we could pray for each other? What would that look like? Those are, and we, we could go on and on and on. Those are all ways you could decide, I'm going to get out of the salt container that we're all in on Sunday morning, right? And I'm going to go season my city this week. And I'm going to let that light shine there. Some of you are doing a lot of these things already. Bless you. And I would encourage you to stay with it. Some of you, if you're really honest with yourselves, you're not doing any of these things. And remember what God said. If, if your salt is just going to sit here in this box, it's going to be what? Worthless. If your light is sitting there with a bucket over it, it's worthless, right? Honoring God says, you are, God says, you want to honor me, go out and love people the way I loved them, right? Love people the way I loved them. Well, Jesus said something else too. Could I have my, uh, my worship group come on up here? They're going to do this last song with us together. And while they're doing that, go ahead and give me that last slide. Did I have one more slide on that deck before we got into this? Yeah. Hey, let's all say this one more time about our mission. And let's, yeah, I got that. I got that, thanks. What's our mission? Let's say it together. Honor God and love people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. 